Brian Harlow was named head of manufacturing of F for FCA North America in October 2014. In this position, he's responsible for all assembly, stamping, and powertrain manufacturing operations in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, as well as implementation of the world-class manufacturing system at all FCA U.S. manufacturing facilities. Mr. Harlow was most recently global head of powertrain manufacturing, engineering, and vice president head of NAFTA powertrain operations, where he was responsible for all powertrain facilities in the United States and Canada, which included global responsibility for powertrain manufacturing engineering at FCA US and Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. Brian joined the company in 1978 as a plant engineer at the Kokomo, Indiana transmission plant and has since held a series of various manufacturing positions of increasing responsibility. His work and academic background also includes Vice President of Powertrain Operations, General Manager of Transmission, Casting and Machining, Director of Advanced Manufacturing Engineering and Powertrain Operations, Director of Staff Manufacturing Engineering, Manufacturing Manager at Indiana Transmission Plant 1 in Kokomo, Indiana and various manufacturing positions at Kokomo Transmission Plant in Indiana Transmission Plant 1 with former Chrysler Corporation. Brian earned his Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Purdue University and a Master of Management from Indiana Wesleyan University. Brian lives with his wife Rochelle in Clarkston. They have three children and five grandchildren. He loves to play piano and really loves to play golf. Please help me welcome our featured speaker for today, Brian Harlow. Thank you, Mike. Well, in thinking about this, once uh, Mike had talked to me and Jade and I had some conversation about coming and speaking today, you know, I was looking forward to this, knowing that I would see some old familiar faces, and certainly have, and uh, so it's a pleasure to be able to stand in front of you today, and an honor as well, and then in the not too distant future sit with you. But, <laughs> Well, as I look at the faces, and I'll leave somebody out by doing this, but I don't really care. If I, mean, I care if I leave you out, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, I saw Roman. Roman, you know, for whatever uh, value I had to the company, it's people like Roman and Dick Albrecht and, you know, uh, Jim. I worked in engineering for you for a couple of years, my only time out of manufacturing, and I could only last two years. But, <laughs> no, it was a great experience, really. It was, it was back when we did the resident engineering teams in the plants. Um, Sue, of course, I worked a lot with. Meg, we lost Meg uh, to other things, but uh, Meg's one of really a good friend and a great person. And others I see around the room, um, and you know, I and Deb Morissette. You know, I look at people who were like when I was there. I look up at them, and wow, these are amazing people. And you still are, uh, not knowing some someday that I'd have more responsibility than I ever anticipated and be in, uh, have the opportunity to stand in front of you like I am today. So again, thank you for being here. Um, you said it was summer, so I don't know if there's less people than normal since I'm here or more, but you know, yeah. <laughs> just don't tell me, okay? Don't tell me. No, it's... So I thought as I, uh, you know, of, of interest, I would think a little bit, and, and if you were here as we transition into and out of bankruptcy, would you raise your hand? A lot more than I thought. <laughs> Many of you were there. So you, you know what I'm talking about. And certainly if you weren't there, you know some of the other aspects of things. I just saw you. Hi. Yeah. Wow. I see more faces I stand up here. <laughs> uh, and recognize more faces. But uh, anyway, at the time, you know, I was running um, the transmission division operationally. So we had the plants in Kokomo and uh, Toledo Machining that, that Joe Huber knows well about. And things obviously weren't going well. And the week of bankruptcy, Frankie was issued on Wednesday, the 29th of April, called us to his office and said, hey, this looks like we're really gonna, it's really gonna happen. We're gonna go into bankruptcy. Well, I was there in 1978 and saw one, you didn't know if the paycheck, you know, they kept telling me the paycheck might not cash. 
we went and Lee Ackdorf became and things got better, right? So for me it was, and we went through the 1990, 89, 90, right? It was bad then. So every 10 years is normal, good, bad, right? So I'm thinking this is just another bad. But he said that, I was like, wow, this might really happen. Next day he called us back to his office and said, go ahead and call your plants and tell them to, to shut down tomorrow, today. And it was the most difficult thing to do was to call those plants and say, orderly shut down all your facilities, send the people home. And they told us, you know, there was speculation, we all that were here, you know, there at the time, somewhere six to eight weeks, we didn't know, you know, if we'd come out or not, but for the next six to eight weeks, probably we didn't know if we'd be at work or be home, where we'd be. So the next day on Friday, May 1st, Frankie was just and called us back again, which seemed odd, because we already shut him down. And he said, uh, you need to be here Monday morning. We'll be representing from Fiat here. Oh, wow. So we showed up Monday morning, and there was an entourage. And the strangest thing, it was so different than anything I expected. From May 4th, Monday, May 4th, till me standing here in front of you today, we've been on a dead run. <laughs> I mean a dead run. I, I can't, <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing, but we immediately had people in our business and uh, world-class manufacturing became a fire hose of information and expectations and we called a few people back to into the plants. The hope was and the intent was to have a different looking plants, at least in some cases, when the people walked back in on day one. So we actually had people come back. We did work, but there was a little bit of money that was allocated from the government and we didn't spend a lot, but we had people painting. We had everybody doing all kinds of different things. Again, trying to change the mindset. So then, just before we came out of bankruptcy on June 10th, we're in our ninth year now, just had an eighth anniversary as FC, well, variations and ultimately FCA. I got this email notifi meeting notification from Nancy Ray, which wasn't normal for me. I said, you know, show up at this time, 45 minute meeting with this guy named Sergio Marchione. Thank you. And I, the worst thing that happened to me, I, I, had a, I had my back blown out. I'd done some bunch of yard work and blew my back out. I was six weeks, right during this time, I could, my wife was driving me around and I was laying on my back most of the time in my office. Ended up having surgery in August and fixed it, thankfully. So it was just a bad time. And so I go to the meeting not knowing what to expect. And I sit down and we were in the executive dining room. There were, it was a, just a small table. Nancy was on one side and named, a lady named Linda Knoll who was the HR head of uh, C&H Industrial was on the other side and then Sergio sat across. So the lady, uh, Linda Knoll says, so, and they had a bunch of organizational charts laid out. That was a high life. You, know, you pay attention. She says, well, so what's your responsibility? And I told her, which she knew anyway. How many plants you have? I told her six. And so she says, well, how about your boss? How many has he got? He says, well, 10. <laughs> and Sergio, first words he says, well, why is that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I could see this was going really bad. <laughs> 10, 6, I'm out. <laughs> so, so we had more conversation, and he says, uh, so what about transmissions? So, yeah. He says, I think uh, we're going to have to start buying our transmissions. We just uh, don't have time to recover. You know, we had the issue with the good track and all that, and uh, so we're going to have to buy them. I said, well, I disagree. Oh. <laughs> I didn't have anything to lose, I was like, what the heck? That's how I felt anyway. That was my only job, right? They take that away, I was dead. <laughs> so we had this bantering conversation going back and forth. I had no clue who Sergio Marchione was, no clue. Hadn't looked, hadn't seen anything. It's a good thing. <laughs> I'd have been shaking in my shoes if I had any clue who he really was. And so we got done, it was 15 minutes. It's supposed to be 40, you know, it's 45 minute scheduled meeting. I'm used to most meetings, if they're 45, they last an hour, right? So 15 minutes, they say, well, you got any questions? I'm thinking, not good, <laughs> not good. So I said, well, 
I think I screwed up here. So it just came out. You know, we were so emotional anyway, right? It was bankruptcy and we'd been through all that stuff. You know how it felt. It was like, this is the end. And I just said, oh, I think I screwed up. You know, it's only been 15 minutes. I'm like, yeah. And they both said, oh, no, no, no. We, you know, we schedule these things this way. And Sergio put his hand out. He hadn't said a lot other than disagreement. He put his hand out and says, I'll address that. Okay. He said, you did just fine. Stood up, stuck his hand out and said, we'll talk about those transmissions in the future. I thought, well, that's a good thing, future. <laughs> Someone think about it. The next day, Frankie Wazition calls me. He says, what in the heck did you say? <laughs> I don't know. He says, well, come to my office. Okay, I'll come to your office. He plopped down a piece of paper. He says, you're head of powertrain now. <laughs> oh, okay. It was a shock. So, as I say, from that, so then, so then I went, I, they moved to Fred Gettle at the time. He had powertrain. He became head of assembly. So I had powertrain. So the first thing that was the assignment was Fiat would get 5% ownership if we installed the four-cylinder engine labeled the fire at Dundee. As soon as that happened, for those of you who were there, 5% ownership. So that was an urgent thing from somebody's agenda that became an assignment for me. So in eight months, we had it implemented using the assets that were at the south end of the what was the global manufacturing engine plant it became done now done the engine plant. We did that in eight months. The Pinastar, which we had built two plants, we invested in both um, the Trenton location and the Saltillo location. We're pretty well mothballed because we had um, Kenosha, we had Trenton, we had Max, both plants, and we'd again gone into a no spend mode going into that. Well, all that accelerated we need to put them in all the products right away we were we accelerated closures we brought those two plants online in 2010 and when and then within about two month two years we were at a million four we converted mac and we also put more into uh, to trenton well then we finally got back to the transmission discussion and we hooked up with uh, zf and we decided to, to spend money in kokomo a lot of it and we had the eight speed, which now is proliferating our, our products, and the nine speed, which certainly had as many transmissions had, a little limp, limp into, the, into the world, but is uh, a strong performer for us now uh, in all our front wheel drive products. So that was in the first four years or so coming out of bankruptcy. As, as he mentioned, as Mike mentioned, uh, Sergio has this way of doing things. You have one local hat and one global hat. And my global hat was the rest of powertrain. So we were doing engines in South America, in um, El Horizonte. Uh, we were doing engines in China and doing engines in Italy as well. Uh, so we did that. So by the time 14 rolled around, 2014 rolled around, we've had a lot of those things implemented and going and I had made a choice. I was gonna retire. So I let him know that uh, I was retired. This was almost exactly, well, I'll say May of 2014. So I went in and, uh, and, and told Mike Keegan, and and he told Sergio. I was and I had three guys all lined up. I was, in the, you know, the session plan was in good play, and uh, I was going to go out in 15, March of 15. We give him plenty of time. So in September, I get this call from Mike Keegan. Mike says, "Hey, did you come to my office?" Yeah, okay. So I did. He says, uh, Sergio would like for you to think about doing something different. I said, well, I am. I'm retiring. <laughs> he said, no, that's not what he's thinking. Okay. So he said he'd like you to take on all the manufacturing. Oh, really? So in the compilation of all those things, here I am. So the shift in, we had pretty much got powertrain. We've done a few things that, that need to be done since then, for sure. But And we've got good people in powertrain. I've spent very little time in the last three years of powertrain. I've spent all my time in assembly plants and stamping plants, learning the things I hadn't done in the past, only been around. So that takes us to what happened in 2014. Uh, we also did some operational things. And I'm going to skip over this because it took longer than I should have on the other stuff. But all these things, world-class manufacturing and, 
operational access, Mike, you said you were in Jefferson North. I appreciate your comments. They were favorable. And I think that, that uh, world-class manufacturing, and I'll talk about them again, is absolutely fundamental improvement to our operations. But uh, so 2014, we had completed the first phase of uh, recovery from bankruptcy. And so we'll go to this. And we had some key initiatives to deal with um, when we did that. So in doing that, we looked at um, where do we go? What do we do? So one of the things I think that Sergio is a master at is branding. He's got some very good people uh, that's, that works with him on the group executive committee. Leslie husband, uh, Mark, for sure, and as well as Scott Garberding and some others. But Sergio is a master at understanding branding. And uh, so he said, we're going to tap into the Jeep brand. Um, we're going to localize production in certain regions. So we've since that time uh, put uh, in locations in Italy, in, in uh, Melfi. We have Jeep operations in Pernambuco and a brand new facility in Brazil. We have Jeep operations in two facilities in China. Um, in Changsha and Guangzhou, all operational, and now we're bringing online uh, the Compass in, uh, in India. So all those things have, was on the plan for Jeep. It expanded. Um, we've also expanded the portfolio. The Renegade wasn't in existence, it is now. Of course, we made the transition to the new Compass, which you said is out here, right? So you know, we're in the, in the production of that in multiple locations, but for us in NAFTA in uh, Toluca, and then we've had five straight years of record sales and over one million units sold in three years. And uh, it's a significant accomplishment of what's happening. The goal is a lot more than that, actually. We're more, quite a bit more than a million last year. And the goal is to flip that seven digit again, I think. So it's, a, it's a, been a, an endeavor that's went, went well so far, and I think will continue. The second initiative was in the luxury segment. So, with Alfa Romero and Maserati being a part of Fiat Chrysler and the former Fiat before that, that's been a big focus. And it did a couple of things, and that's one of the other initiatives was to take the existing operations and utilize them in Italy. So there was three plants that were really underutilized. And so Maserati and Alfa Romero both have come back to life, uh, and we're in the process now uh, of Local, not localizing, but selling the Alpha here in uh, the U.S. and it's going well. Hello, Mark. Wow, I keep seeing faces. Um, and the latest launch on that was the Levante. You may have seen it in the press. Uh, but again, a beautiful vehicle that's made in Mia Fiori. Um, the third initiative was, was to target volume growth. And uh, again, that had to do with filling up all the plants we have, and that's been accomplished. Uh, the fourth was to strengthen the balance sheet, well, always important for all of us in a company. So there was a refinancing of the bonds, which elimin eliminated all the FCA ring fencing, which may be good or bad from whoever's perspective, but it did allow us to move capital in the places that we needed to and make the right choices. And lastly on this page is uh, to double our margins and to be at a level that's in the competition. And uh, we've come a ways with that. Um, we're at pretty good numbers right now. With Sergio, they're never good enough, trust me. <laughs> so we've got financial targets that we put in place at the same time for 14 and on forward. And if you see, if you can read the chart, a little small numbers here, but there's green check marks on all of these. So for 14, through 16, we were able to achieve our key financial targets for net revenues, adjusted earnings before interest and taxes and margins, and adjusted net profit as well as net industrial debt. And our first quarter for 2017 results showed that we continue that improvement and uh, we expect to meet our guidance for the year. In the next slide, this is a very interesting slide in many aspects. It's a good news story and completeness, but it speaks uh, the value of NAFTA too, and the, the original Chrysler that we're all familiar with. Uh, for 2016, we reported record profits for a full year with earnings before interest, interest and taxes of 6.1 billion euro, 
We had shipments worldwide of 4.7 million units, and we had net revenues of uh, 111 billion dollars, or euros, sorry. Uh, even though that was flat, we still had more profits. And all segments were profitable and showed improvement on a year-over-year -year basis. And the key thing here, one of the key things out of that uh, 5 point, or 6.1 billion, 5.1 billion was generated here in the former Chrysler of NAFTA. Our increase from 15 to 16, if you really small numbers on the chart here, but we went from 92% profit generation in 2015, we dropped to 85% because the others grew, thankfully. But our growth was 600 million, which the growth of ours from 15 to 16 was more than all of Europe, Middle East, and Africa, or the MEA next biggest market was in total of a half a billion euro. So we're still the muscle here. It all matters and it all contributes, but uh, we still need to do our part in a big way. In the next chart, since uh, we had the struggles in 2009, NAFTA sales have climbed from 1.2 million a year to 2.6 million. Our market share is back in the norm of where it used to be, it went down to under nine, it's up in the push in 13. Our utility vehicle percentage of the market is up to 16% where it was 11 and we're at 22% of the truck market where we were at just under 16. So we're bringing new utility vehicles and trucks to the market. Uh, as I mentioned, the Alfa Romeo Stelvio the latest SUV was just launched, and we've got future models on the Wagoneer, the Grand Wagoneer coming, and the Wrangler, which I'll talk more about the Wrangler in particular in a minute. And then the Grand Cherokee and the pickup truck. We have uh, the Jeep Cherokee working on a refresh, replace of it in the very near future. And then uh, we're working on the new truck, which I'll talk more about here in just a minute. So if we look more specifically at the first quarter of 2017, uh, we started with another strong quarter. We'll announce our second quarter earnings next Thursday, and uh, hopefully they won't disappoint. Uh, we again achieved a sizable year over year from quarter to quarter, increase in all the categories of the financial targets that I mentioned before. And uh, we're moving forward in all our key initiatives to localize, as we talked before, about production in the various regions around the world um, with new products uh, for RAM sales in NAFTA, driving really the growth volume. And as I say, I'll talk the details in a minute about that. Margins are up in all regions except Latin America. Latin America is by far the toughest region. It's, it's that kind of neutral position right now with the geopolitical situation as well as just the general uh, economy it's the weak it's the weak area our cash flow has improved and our gross debt has been reduced and uh, we our results were achieved despite the reality we've got sites out of production so we've had Toledo North out of production we've had Belvedere out of production we've had Shap out of production in this whole retool that we'll talk about the next slide really talks about why we're doing what we're doing now in NAFTA. So for all of us who've worked at Chrysler and its various names over the years, we've seen charts like this many times. We've seen the gas prices up in the gas prices now. I, I just read this week where a Michigan assembly plant for Ford has flipped six times between trucks and cars. So this is not a new song, it's an, it's an old song. However, I think there may be some adjustments more than before, and I'll digress just a little bit. Back in the 80s when we were, uh, and I left out Jim Robertson, but Jim was there. Uh, there you are, Jim. We were, we were in uh, Kokomo together, and uh, in the mid-80s, and right after all the fuel economy issues, right, the front-wheel drive, we were getting out of trucks. Anybody remember that? We were getting out of trucks. We took my plant, Kokomo Transmission Plant, and downsized two or three million capacity of rear-wheel drive down to 200,000, that was it. And then here comes Jeep, 
of all American Motors, right? And the world kind of flipped around. So to say we haven't flipped before would be not true. We've flipped multiple times, right? So it's not so unusual to be in this. It's just how fast can you do it? The thing I'll say this time is we're ahead of the curve. We're ahead of the curve kind of because of a leader who really has some, I would say, real insight to the, the, the world in general with all the jobs he has. Uh, but he's just really a genius in the business. But, but he also has <laughs> what it takes to just say, hey, we, sh we didn't make the right call here. We're going to make a different call. So we're taking a Sterling Heights plant that we just tooled up and ripped it all out. It takes some uh, real gumption to go to the board and uh, all the shareholders and expect that to be accepted. Now what we're seeing, GM and Ford both are laying shifts off in their car vehicle plants. They're taking shifts off, actually. We're looking at hiring some of those people because we need them in, in ours. So we're about, I would say, 18 months to two years ahead, which is a big deal in our industry, right? Ahead of the curve in preparation for this shifting. But when you look at this chart, and again, we've looked at lots of them, it would indicate we're in a good way on the, on the prices. And if you look at it from this chart, and again, it may be hard for you to read, but if you see the cars going down the hill, <laughs> that's a 20, that goes back to 1990 all the way to 2020. And that is a downhill slide that it leveled off during the spike of the gas prices, but didn't recover, it just leveled off. And now it's back to going down. Whereas you look at the utilities and the trucks, and you're seeing you know, a different indication. So we believe, our economists, our people, believe that it would take a $5 a, a gallon gasoline price to really shift away from the desire to have the utility value of a, of a SUV or a truck. And the realities are that our capabilities to perform in with uh, fuel prices has improved a lot in our powertrains with the changes we made. And so again, the difference between a car and an SUV isn't so dramatic anyway, uh, as you again compare it to its utility value. So we think we're on the right track and we think others, we're the leader and not the follower in this case. We'll see if we can take advantage of it uh, for that. Large truck has consistently averaged on this 12% of the market. And that's an, again, in a growing market over the last eight years. In the next slide, we're talking about the industrialization now that is a result of the recognition of what we just looked at. So the endeavor is significant. We started uh, in Saltillo. Somebody asked me uh, in the breakdown just before we start here about the journey, if it was going to be uh, renewed, and it's not. But we were killing it, and we unkilled it. <laughs> We extended it and then we extended it again. So, so far, it's extended through next year because it sells well and does well, and we make a lot of a good amount of money on it, and it sells well in Latin America and uh, as well as in Europe, as well as here. But in addition to that vehicle, we added a, we retooled for the Compass. So we make the Journey, the Fiat 500, full electric mostly, uh, but some 500s, regular gas, and then we tooled up for this uh, compass and then added the third shift. So we make uh, 1,200 a day in that plant. Uh, we started in the beginning of the year with the compass and, uh, and we're a full throw there now with it. But that was step one to free up Belvedere. So we took the compass, which replaced the compass and the Patriot and the Dart, of course, went, went down with the rest of the cars. So that cleaned up Belvedere. So we've been in the process of moving uh, all the tooling out of Toledo North. We launched in June. We're in the, right in the middle of launching the Cherokee. And as with any launch, it's always fun. Uh, but we're going full throttle. And then we do a refresh on the Compass or the Cherokee um, in January. So not only are we moving it, we did 17 mile years to close out. We just are now switching to 18 mile a year uh, in about 10 days, and then we go to 19 mile a year in January. So you can imagine the dance for that. Don't ask me why, we just like to do stuff that's difficult. No, I'm kidding. So that was step one, frees up the Wrangler. So again, why, why do all this moving instead of retooling as we've done more often? 
Because again, we couldn't afford to take the rainbow out of production. We couldn't afford to take the truck out of production. We couldn't afford to take the cars out of production. So that's what's underway. So we immediately began in um, at April to retool Toledo North for the new Wrangler. Uh, we're almost complete with that. We've built over 400 of the new Wranglers in what we call the Process Center. They're beautiful vehicles. It's a, it's a new generational change in the structural, architectural portion. Um, it has the, the future cap capability for plug-in electric hybrid, a lot of things. But it didn't take the Jeep away. I can't show pictures, of course, but I can tell you it is absolutely going to be successful. It's an interesting thing, the old Wrangler, when we put the six, uh, the Pentastar with the, uh, the Daimler transmission that we started building back in uh, 2002 or so, the sales jumped about 50%. We thought it was a, this was back in mid-14, we thought it was a kind of a blip. Well, that blips lasted till we run that plant, Toledo South, every day, every day, never stops, every day. And there's still about 40,000 orders waiting with that. So we're gonna run both plants simultaneously for a period of time. So we're gonna launch in November of this year, the new Wrangler. We're gonna to continue to run the old Wrangler through March or so of next year. So we'll have hopefully met all that unmet demand. We increased the capacity. We were making 240,000 at Toledo South a year on 180,000 capacity. Uh, and we're gonna, we go up to about the 320,000 or so capacity on the Wrangler, new Wrangler. And then we're gonna come in behind that and do the Wrangler truck in Toledo South, which launches in about uh, a little less than two years. So that takes us, keep, go ahead. I'm kind of jumping ahead of the slides here. So phase one, go ahead. These are the launch timings. Um, again, we already did the compass, the Cherokee's underway. Uh, the Wrangler starts in November and then the Ram starts in January. So bang, 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 right after another. And again, we've, so we've spent about 350 million to do the retool here, upgrading the plant itself too. So again, oh, that's essentially all done. Although I do have life support in the plant right now. Um, Retooling of Toledo North, $700 million. And as I say, it's essentially done. We're in the final stages of the trim lines and paint shops done, body shops done. Um, and as I say, the final assembly is, is nearing it. We've had our first probe units go on down the line. So again, we're just, we'll do our uh, final phase of pilots, or PS pilots in August, and then launch in November. And then uh, at Sterling Heights, we're retooling it, uh, and it's a $1.5 billion project. In that case, again, we basically gutted the entire place, except for the new paint shop that was put in for the Chrysler 200 and the new body shop. Uh, obviously, the paint shops were usable pretty much as is. The new body shop was some retooling, not a lot. They're pretty flexible body shops. Completely, the general assembly's all new, uh, and then we took the old Chrysler Avenger and Sebring, uh, Chrysler Sebring and Dodge Avenger uh, paint shop that had been idled when we built the new paint shop and it is now retooled, uh, completely redone with a new paint shop for the box for the truck. And then we put a new box body shop inside uh, Sterling Heights and again all that together. So I was there yesterday, we had industrial head review and uh, as with all things there's opportunities to work on but it's come along well. We've built about 150 trucks in the process center. Uh, again, these are simulation. We've had them similar in the past, like the pilot plant, only we've taken it to the plants and we have the actual tooling that's on the line as well as the fixtures and so forth. Rotating carriers, which helps a lot on the ergonomic side of the world and quality side of the world. Um, but again, we're well on our way here. Both of these jobs, both of these uh, are bringing new jobs to Toledo and to, to Sterling Heights. It's surprising how difficult it is not is to hire people now, both hourly and salary, and to keep them is even more difficult. Uh, again, as you know, it's a tough business and we work people pretty hard, so. And then you may have seen the press clippings on uh, what we're doing at Warren Truck following that. Although we're in deep discussions about what we're gonna do with the old truck. You know, we got meetings, uh, I told some of the people, we have uh, Sergio, 
doesn't differentiate. He's very, how would I say it? He's not um, partial to any given day of the week. He, he is happy to have meetings every day. <laughs> and the group product committee is, uh, uh, Leslie knows better than me, but um, it starts, it's in Marinella in Italy, but we're going to do it on Telepres on our end, and it starts at 3 a.m. Saturday morning for us. So that's, that's just normal, the way we do business. So, and uh, so we're going to talk about this. Uh, we think the trucks can keep selling like they are. There's a big opportunity in the fleet side. So even with the new truck, which will make 72 jobs an hour, 407,000 trucks a year at Sterling Heights, and we'll still have uh, capacity at Warren Truck that we're gonna for sure extend, um, well, we're proposing to expand two out of the three crews, so two thirds of its capacity for, for a period of time. And then we'll retool it at the last minute because we don't shut down any before uh, to do the, the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer uh, in the 2020 timeframe. So all that, three and a half billion dollars later and a lot of blood, sweat and tears as we've all done in the past and 3,700 new jobs. Uh, we really believe we're gonna be in a great place as a company. Um, debt free, that's the goal for 2018, a big deal. But we're on track with those numbers, and uh, yeah, Sue's been right there. Uh, she knows exactly what I'm talking about when we talk about the, when the meetings are. She got to experience that too. All right, I'm going to give you a quick video here and then wrap up with a couple of slides, and I'll be out of here. But this gives you an idea of some of the work we've been doing in these three facilities. If we're successful, in short. It's just music, so you're not messing much. <laughs> That's a little snippet of, uh, of some of the work. Uh, so again, our focus in manufacturing, we've, uh, quality has always been a topic of discussion. You see it in the press and uh, we've made improvements. You saw the 931 team leaders. We've gone to a one in six ratio on team leaders, similar to Toyota, it's helped us. One of the, uh, how would I say, the unintended consequences of uh, some of the negotiations that were very favorable for us in terms of wages also makes it less desirable to work. So keeping people isn't that easy. Uh, and these jobs are not easy, they're not, with their salary. So we spend a lot of time in training. 
the metrology centers is a new thing that came with us with Fiat. It's been a truly outstanding tool for us. And we are able to get the datums of the vehicles and the stampings and we're really to nominal on almost everything. And the fits and finishes and those kind of things have improved significantly in our ability to do that. Um, standardized work is a big, big, big thing again with the turnover of people and we're working on those kind of things. So WCM, World Class Manufacturing, which is 10 technical pillars and 10 managerial pillars, very intense. Takes two days of auditing when they go through all this process and it takes the work of the team, but again, it's transformed our plans in a big way and it's helped our people in uh, understanding the business in a better way. So I'm gonna close with uh, this last this last side. So we all know we're different at Chrysler Wright or FCA still. Uh, we've always been a little bit off on the edge. And despite the fact that we have a strategy to the things we talked about, and despite the fact that we you know, uh, are trying to reach the market and sell, we have two th areas, and Deb knows this really well, we have compliance we've got to worry about a lot. So we have the, the Pacifica that we launched uh, two years ago, and we're in the, the midst of working through the launch of the plug-in electric hybrid. Has anybody driven one in here? They're very good, they're outstanding. With any transmission, this is very complicated because it runs fully electric and fully um, on gas and the transition you can't tell. Uh, but there are some things we're working our way through so we've limited the volume to some extent. We're just about there. But it's a very, very big part of our compliance. It has, we need to sell these uh, in order for that to occur, for us to comply I mean. And on the flip side of that then is the, the Grand Cherokee Trackhawk SRT, it's a 707 horsepower Hellcat engine in it, coming out in August. We're gonna start making that, so if you wanna go fast, you have the opportunity in that one. Of course, you know about the Hellcat and the Challenger. And if we just announced recently this Demon. Now, I don't know if we want Demons. We had the Cerberus once, which was the three-headed monster out of uh, hell in Roman mythology. It didn't work out real well. <laughs> so hopefully the Demon's a little better than that. But, but this Demon is, is really uh, uh, Tim Conexus, who's the CEO president of the, Jeep, or the Dodge and uh, Chrysler brands is uh, pretty innovative and it took him three shots at Sergio for him to finally capitulate. The, uh, the margins on these are off the chart, literally. We're gonna make 3,300 of them. We'll make a lot of money off the ones we sell. So, and there's a standing room only, kind of, you know, the people who buy these are, don't have any shortage of funds. So we're happy to take their money. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me today. You saw the J.D. Powers re re results, I assume. We made a big increase in, uh, in RAM. Our warranty one month in service, as an example, is the lowest it's ever been right now. So we're starting to see it translate. Now, why is that? Scott Garberdine as the head of uh, quality certainly helps us. But even before that, about a year before that, we, we uh, hooked up with J.D. Powers. We have J.D. Powers in the plant. And uh, this standardized work that I've talked about, we've talked about this a lot in the past, in our, all of our past, but never to the level of implementation that we're doing today. Um, so the team leader involvement and the level and the not letting the defects out of the workstation, we're, we're struggling as at, uh, at Belvedere right now to make the volume groove, and we're struggling because we're stopping the line. The end on cord is pulled. So we want the people to stop it. 
You know, we've had, obviously we talked about recalls and other things. I mean, that's a reality. We spend a lot of money. You know, I told them we're doing a global organization that Fiat's done in the past. So we're adding about 50 salary people in each plant. Harbor is important to some level. Sorry, if, you know, I you guys back there, but you know, we can't save enough taking people out. That, that whole thought process doesn't work. Okay. Okay, go ahead. I have a question for the, uh, excuse me. Okay, the requirements for loaning it out to a neighbor or a friend? Yes. So all you are required to do is make sure they have a valid driver's license. Then you can loan that vehicle for up to seven consecutive days. So if you have a neighbor that's interested in the Pacifica, you have a Pacifica, uh, they're going to Florida. You can loan that vehicle to them for the seven consecutive days. And uh, when they return it, hopefully we made a sale. <laughs> How much children and no food with you? If they're interested in the vehicle. <laughs> It's a fit problem. <laughs> it won't fit. We're looking at um, you know, I, the the tiger shark is a bit of a struggle. Um, I said that wrong. Actually, tell me your question again. The question was, will the six cylinder? Can you put the six cylinder yeah. in the compass? Yeah. Oh, you can buy it today. Sorry. You can buy it today. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can buy it today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We have, we have one here. Mr. Harlow, uh, I've read an article that GM is cutting back in countries like uh, India and some other countries. Instead of expanding, I, it sounds like we're going just the opposite. You know what? You're right. You're right. But you know what we're putting in there? A Jeep. A Jeep will go better, play, go more places than other vehicles will, right? So, yeah, we're not putting the cars in there. So, just, uh, and it's just in home made. So, the compass made there, we believe will do well. Okay, we got another one here. This is a question for the company cars. Um, maybe unfair, but. Is there any talk of uh, being able to use any of the elbows? Oh. <laughs> at, at this time, no. There is no problem. Okay, I, I have one more. Can you mention browsers that we have? One of them is Chrome. Internet Explorer is the best one. Apple and Chrome. For some reason, our antiquated systems. Just don't, don't want to make it. So, hopefully, in the future, we can work with the Chrome and the, the Apple, especially Apple. A lot of people have Apple. I was going to say, 90% of us have Apple. So, we're hoping we can move forward with that as of right now. It's a Firefox works, yes. I've been there and done that. What is the pilot plant at the old at the tech center used for? Yeah, so the the question is on the pilot plant at the tech center. So it's used by engineering. So they do the really early stuff there. Um, it, it, again, as you know, there was just the hand robot or the hand weld guns and that kind of thing. So you know, we do the, and the the paint booths are just those small paint booths. So we just do. The early stuff there. Prior to your Correct. Correct. Yeah. Now, once we what we call VP, which is uh, 36 weeks ahead of production, we build them in the plants. Now in the process center, but first, but it's 
it is. It's all part of a, a standard compliance for us on, the, on all the validation. Yep. Um, with so much going on with autonomy and battery technology, where is uh, FCA in terms of uh, Tesla and GM and the Bolt and a lot of other things? I mean, the industry is going through such technological changes over the next five or ten years. Are we prepared as a company to really be there by 2025? So, so it's, an, it's a definitely a part of our normal product committee discussions on a monthly basis and in the group product meeting on a monthly basis. So uh, y the answer is yes. Um, we are lining up with battery suppliers and we have, trust me, we have a whole compliance plan through 2025 of what it takes for us to do what we're doing with this plan that we've talked about today and what happens 2020 really starts to change the world a bit, right? But certainly plug-in electric is a big part of us, uh, of our portfolio plan. Fully electric, again, we're... Um, the Pacific is also a big part of it. And again, I didn't mention this earlier, and you may be aware of this if you read it in the press, but Google became spun off Waymo, and they, we have 600 vehicles, plug-in electric hybrid uh, Pacific is that they have out west, and they're part of the autonomous driving activity. So um, Sergio's hooked up with Tim Cook. You name the guy, and I'll tell you, he just met with him in the last whatever. So trust me. He is a fully engaged with the leaders in the industry in every aspect of this. And is he wants to be, I think as a general statement, a really fast follower and not be spending the money. He wants to go on the, the dime of somebody else, but we'll be right there ready to jump in. So, so he's keeping his ducks in a row. Yeah. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you, Brian, Leslie, Nancy, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for com coming. Be careful driving home, and we will see you in October's meeting. Thank you. Bye-bye.